Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the MCI, dear students, dear alumni, dear partners, dear guests of today's distinguished guest lecture of our live talk, I'm more than pleased to welcome you all. Uh, and we have a very, very distinguished guest here today. It is uh, the chief representative of BISF in China and he is also the uh, president of the European Chamber of Commerce in China. So having both uh, very, very high ranked functions, let me please we express a very warm welcome to Mr. Jörg Wutke. Great to have you with us. Thank you for inviting. Let me also please welcome uh, my co-moderator assisting me and helping me with uh, questions in the Q&A session. She is professor at the MCI. She is the head of our China Set Center. We um, uh, recently established a new China Center. Let me express a warm welcome as well to the director of this institution, Professor Dr. Wei Manske Wang. Happy to have you. My pleasure. Greetings from Innsbruck. Now, uh, we unfortunately are having obviously some um, technical issues. That means we will try to bring uh, Mr. Wutke in also via video while, while this event. But basically, we can see him already in the picture in the middle of in the center of the frame. And, uh, but we can hear him well and he can hear us. That means we are ready to start. Now, what is the context of this event? First of all, MCI is celebrating its 25th Jubilee year and we are celebrating our anniversary this year, actually in this semester, in this academic year. And uh, in this series, in our Jubilee series, we already have been uh, welcoming inspiring guests and receiving a fascinating insight from personalities like Severin Schwan, the chief executive of Roche, Michael Otto, the chairman of the Otto Group, Katharina Reiche, she was secretary, uh, state secretary uh, in the uh, Merkel administration, is now the chief executive of Vesta Energy, our federal minister of labor, Martin Kocher, Peter Hochholdinger, the vice president of Lucid Motors, and many more. But today, I'm more than pleased to address the audience to a highly relevant and also highly actual topic. Now, Europe and China are partnering together, have been working together very, very nicely. But the topic of today is China and Europe Global Partnership or Competition. Mr. Wutke, dear Jörg, Thank you for sharing your, your, your views on this. Also, thanks to our media partner, partners, our event partners, and I may perhaps specially, especially mention two of them today. The one is the European School of Management and Technology in Berlin, a nice partner university of the MCI. And the other one is the Lebensraum Tirol, now having this week 
its uh, Perspektivenwoche talking about the strategies of the, uh, for the region for uh, the years to come. Now, Mr. Wodka, the floor is yours, dear Jörg. Uh, uh, we will be happy to receive your, your keynote, your insights. Uh, Professor Altman, dear Andreas, it's a great honor and pleasure to celebrate with you 20 years. Uh, as a matter of fact, the European Chamber, which I presently chair, turned 20 last year. So we are simply aged and 20 definitely feels great age. Um, secondly, of course, um, I would like to be with you in uh, Austria, but travel restrictions from China make it impossible. And I guess that's going to go straight way into 2022 uh, because uh, China has uh, imposed a very strict uh, 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 entry regiment. Uh, even if you have a visa, you have to have a special injection and then three weeks of quarantine. That, of course, uh, makes it virtually impossible for normal business travel. Uh, it's a great place, safe. Uh, China has conquered the COVID very, very fast. Uh, and, uh, well, they, they pay a premium for safety, unfortunately, and that makes traveling impossible. Uh, I love Innsbruck. Uh, I've been there on vacation. Uh, after Altbach, and so anyhow, miss that. Well, I'm supposed to talk about China and Europe. Um, well, let me first say that uh, actually trade is, of course, the dominant theme, uh, and things are doing extremely well. We have um, 1 billion uh, euro every day sold from China to the European Union, and the European Union sells into China every day 500 million. So that's a heck of a lot and just proves that uh, China likes obviously European products, but it proves even more how competitive and qualitative sound uh, Chinese products are that they actually conquered a big chunk of the European market. But if you distance yourself a little bit from the fact that actually as Ministry of Commerce here stated, uh, China and Europe are the biggest trading partner, that's true, but only partly true. Uh, as a matter of fact, they refer to goods trading, and yes, there are the biggest number, China and Europe, but it possibly is lopsided because China, as I said, sells twice as much to Europe than Europe sells to China. To give you a little bit of a feel on this one, um, we have um, uh, trade uh, that goes into Britain 40% more than trade into the People's Republic. And U.S. trade is more than twice of what we are selling as Europeans into this market here in China. Um, and as a matter of fact, just four years ago, China overtook Switzerland as a market for European products to sell. Now, you obviously can see the difference in the size of the Swiss market and the Chinese market. Uh, two things on this one. First of all, it just shows what huge upside potential the Chinese market has. We wish, given the size of the economy, that we would be here in China selling as much as we do into the United States. And it shows you also the market restrictions, uh, the kind of hurdles we face that makes basically as a market for export of Europe, China just about more interesting than Switzerland. So this is something where actually the European Chamber is trying to engage itself. When you look into trade and services, the other part of the equation, then of course it's even more pronounced. As a matter of fact, and Mofcom left that out, of course, uh, deliberately, obviously, um, we have uh, six times more trade and services to the United States. As a matter of fact, $350 billion and to China, it's only 53. Um, so if you put this all together, as a matter of fact, the US is 40% more important to European business as an export, as a service, um, a market than uh, China. Again, uh, that shows the potential of the Chinese market. After all, it's a huge economy. At the same time, it just shows you in how many ways it is pretty much closed up. So we look into the outlook. Well, how will it look like? Well, frankly, when the BSF economists looked at that, China stands, I guess, for the next 10 years for about 30% uh, of uh, global growth. Now, 30 percent is as much as all the other OECD uh, countries put together. So it is, it is a huge chunk, one third, uh, definitely for the next 10 years. And frankly, uh, my calculations uh, lead beyond 2030. Uh, and in chemicals, my own sector is even more pronounced, 68 percent. So 
Two thirds of the global market demand for the next 10 years comes out of China to the point where actually China will be at 50% of global chemical production in 2040. That is of course massive. And uh, so you have to be here. Um, it's clearly if you are not at the table, you're gonna be on the menu and hence you have to be here and compete here. The, the World Bank did a study for us uh, last year and it just shows basically the development of four economies starting from the point of opening up. So Japan goes first, Taiwan goes second, Korea goes uh, th third, and China opened up say around 1980. So the interesting thing about this is to compare the development of these four economies by GDP per capita in power purchase in parity terms to make it comparable. And it's very interesting that uh, when you compare the first 40 years of China with the first 40 years of Taiwan and uh, Japan and Korea, these four economies developed identical. So it's funny to say that actually China is not an outlier. China developed exactly along the same lines like the economy, say, from Korea. As a matter of fact, if you look into this paper we published last September, uh, you can see that actually China is slightly falling behind. But of course, if you look into the economy of Taiwan, it's 25, 28 million people. Korea, I don't know, has about 40, 50 million. Japan, roughly about 100 plus. So it's times 1.4 billion people. That makes all the difference. Uh, but as a matter of fact, China has not uh, basically outperformed any other of the uh, Eastern Asian economies. Now, that gives us also a lot of confidence because we know where Taiwan, Korea and Japan are moving uh, as they opened up uh, uh, earlier. And uh, so we can project the next 20, 30 years and you can see and guess where China's heading. Now, the World Bank made three scenarios. One is that um, the economy will develop as it is and then China will overtake Japan in about 10 years. Uh, then China will basically uh, turn its back on the world. That's my worry about the dual circulation. And then basically China will not reach Japan for the next 30 years and let alone Korea and Taiwan. And if China really has a comprehensive reform model, it takes off like a rocket. It's unbelievable how fast they will overtake all the other economies. So what we're saying in the chamber is if to the government, it's your choice. I mean, you can, you can determine we want you to grow faster. We want you to win. That's very important uh, for European business. Now, tomorrow um, uh, I will uh, launch a paper, or my colleague will, on our survey, and then you can see basically what our members tell us. Um, that tells you a little bit about how we feel about business. In short, I can tell you now, uh, we were very pessimistic last year around the same time, surprise, surprise, but at the same time, we were all absolutely amazed about how the market was developed and since June and most of us like my own company had a record year. So for European and China, the partnership first and foremost is in uh, trade relations and hence there we need China to open up more in order to give Europe uh, a better choice. Now on the competition part, that's of course where politics starts and that's getting more and more dicey and it has to do with the fact that unfortunately China managed to turn its soft power and its to uh, global um, ranking um, as from 60, 70% favorable um, in uh, Europe or particularly in my country, Germany, to, uh, to 75% negative, unfavorable within 15 years, unbelievable. 75% um, uh, sounds bad, but it's not as bad as Korea and Japan. Look at China, it's 80 plus percent negative. And of course, the competition or the kind of global partnership relationship between countries, democratically elected countries and China particularly, of course, rests on the fact that our leaders are looking at polls. So how do you do policy when China is 60, 70% positive? Of course, you engage, you try to be more partner, but now, of course, as China is uh, viewed by the public opinion more as adversary, that makes it very difficult for the leadership in Europe in order to find the political space in order to engage in positive ways in China. And you can see how that has changed. The same actually is mirror image here. And you look into global times, uh, how young Chinese in particular look at the West, it is a complete turnaround. 
from very positive, curious, we learn from the West, to absolutely very negative uh, uh, by that phase. That again gives Chinese leaders very little political space themselves in order to do something. So I'm really worried that this kind of global partnership, which has been serving us so well um, over the last uh, 30 years, is being challenged and leads uh, to this kind of fracturation, the deglobalization, or as a recent study uh, from us has proven, to decoupling in particular on the technology side. So where's politics heading? Well, um, we have uh, a very robust nationalism here in China, um, and uh, it doesn't hide the fact that they believe the West is for going down and the East is rising. That doesn't help in communications, of course. Uh, and in the West, of course, you have now uh, the United States with uh, President Biden, who is able to actually forge alliances in order to consider how to take on China. So the China competition actor from China-Europe relationship actually has to do a lot with the United States. And of course, you know, G7 is going to meet very soon. And top of the list, I guess, uh, besides COVID will be China. So where is that all going to end? I wish I would know. But uh, I stop here and give you, Andreas, maybe the chance uh, uh, to throw a couple of questions at me. Thank you very much, dear Jörg. That was a fascinating, um, a fascinating briefing on China and uh, uh, describing where we stand. I already have a number of questions, but before I raise my first one, I would encourage the audience. We have been sending out the link and in our invitation, it says that uh, questions are welcome and we mean it. And in case you have uh, any question uh, to Mr. Wutke, just drop me a note, an email to livetalk at mci.edu. I repeat, uh, livetalk at mci.edu. And the questions will uh, be shown on my screen and I will be happy to do my best to bring them in wherever uh, I can. Now, my first question. Now, I'm not sure whether this is a difficult question for you, Jörg, uh, but uh, if you had all the power to set some measures uh, on the side of the European uh, Union or European Commission uh, and or on the side of the Chinese administration, what kind of measures would you suggest to be taken to, um, to uh, support the idea of uh, the partnership model rather than of the competition model? Is there anything to be recommended or to be done? Well, given the down, downward spiral, uh, in particular, actually, uh, which is very much regrettable after the very good 2020, where uh, Europe and China managed to sign a geographic indicator uh, agreement. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a um, European-Chinese agreement uh, that Europe protects 100 Chinese products, uh, mostly uh, by Joe uh, uh, spirits as well as uh, tea, uh, from being uh, copied by or name name robbed by Europeans. As well, you know, you have uh, uh, the uh, the Palmer ham, you have champagne, cognac, and Irish whiskey, which now is also protected over here. And it's very interesting because actually the US and Europe don't have such an agreement. So the fact that China and Europe managed this uh, last year was an indicator we can, we can get things done despite American intervention or basically uh, attempts in order to derail this. Now, of course, the flagship thing was the investment agreement in December, again, very strong uh, American objections from the outgoing as well as the incoming administration. Wait for us, uh, you know, you're better off if you do it with us. Uh, luckily, neither uh, for Ursula von der Leyen, Merkel, nor Macron listened to these uh, kind of siren songs. And it was signed uh, on the 30th of December. And uh, it was not an earth shattering Nobel Prize uh, uh, winning uh, uh, paper, but it was a good move forward. It gave business, also Austrian business, more certainty here to operate in, in this uh, uh, economic landscape with state to enterprises, subsidies, and so forth. Yeah, and then uh, basically uh, Europe launched um, sanctions on China in March, and these sanctions were designed similar to the ones that US 
imposed on China, of course, because of the human rights violations in uh, Xinjiang with the U Uyghurs. Um, but the Europeans thought they're you know, going to do it smart and take two guys uh, from the security apparatus that have already been sanctioned by the US, so no harm done, and take two retired security officers. So it was all about the security apparatus and one company uh, where the security apparatus has a major stake in there. They thought that shows willingness in Europe, uh, we do something. At the same time, the sanctions to the Chinese is like, oh, come on, guys, you know, we don't really mean it that much, but, you know, we have to do it. Um, and then an hour later, after it was announced, um, so China was extremely well prepared. Uh, China came back with the mother of all uh, sanctions. Um, it was uh, five out of six parliamentarians in the European Parliament, unheard of including, unfortunately, the guy who's heading the China delegation, Reinhard Bütikofer, Green Party, who is responsible for the China relations. I mean, just imagine you, you shoot uh, out of the pond the guy who's supposed to deal with you. Uh, and unfortunately, five from six parties. So I mean, it just leaves one party that has no sanctioned uh, member. Uh, and then uh, lots of other people, think tankers and, and scientists and academics and what was more curious, the European Security Council, where 27 ambassadors are representing the capitals to talk about securities, they were sanctioned as well. So just imagine, plus all kinds of others. So it was hundreds of people and everybody was sort of like, what the hell went wrong? So the relationship there actually took a really a turn for the worst. Um, and um, uh, of course, uh, immediately it was clear that the investment agreement will not be ratified. How can they? If five out of six parliamentarians are sanctions, uh, the parliament has to show solidarity. Um, and uh, there it is, basically. Great achievement. And in the fridge, I don't know for how many years, uh, after we negotiated seven years. So now comes Merkel. And to your question, Andreas, um, what shall we do? I think Merkel has, um, as she also has nothing to lose. Uh, she's not running for job again. She doesn't have to look at the polls for once. Um, and she has been trying to actually just chill, not make it worse. I think that in itself was already very important. You can't turn things around on that magnitude. Um, and uh, the Chinese uh, leadership, uh, either ill-informed or overly ambitious about punishing Europe, uh, is stuck with this. Uh, we are stuck with our uh, sanctions. Um, and uh, I think Merkel just said, let's, let's see, let's talk, let's find common ground. She did. Uh, talk uh, with China on climate change. That's a common topic. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping has this uh, um, carbon neutrality by 2060, something that should interest Europe immensely. We have the same targets. Uh, second, of course, biodiversity. There is a COP15 in Kunming in October. Um, and then, of course, uh, terrorism. Uh, we have the same interests in, in uh, pirate infested areas and so forth and so forth. So she has been reaching out on topics where we know we have common ground just to confirm that we want to be on talking terms. We don't want to punish each other. But again, uh, the, the thorn is deep in the flesh um, and I don't know how we get it out over the next year or so. Uh, so the areas of corporations are limited. But at the same time, China has chosen to compartmentalize these problems, meaning toxic, politics, bad, let's bash those guys, and so forth and so forth. But at the same time, I have been, for once, subject to a charm offensive. Um, China went the extra mile in order to make business comfortable about uh, solving problems for us, reaching out, and so forth. I mean, it was very telling that the sanctions were in post Monday night uh, on, on Wednesday, I got the notice that the prime minister visits BSF in Nanjing, Friday he did. And uh, that mm -hmm. in itself was already an indicator, we want foreign investment, we want European investment. So let's see. Um, it's, so I, I guess we are now still in the stage of let's not make it worse. Um, Merkel's of course uh, is running out of time. Uh, the new government in Germany will be clearly more uh, adversal to uh, China. Uh, value discussions will be strong and uh, there we have to see where that is leading and uh, I always plead to the Chinese government stop chasing H&M and stop chasing Adidas and all the others um, because that might backfire uh, around the Olympics uh, with the boycott of Chinese products. So if, if it doesn't, Andres, um, 
if it doesn't get worse, it's already a major achievement. But honestly, I don't see an exit ramp where things are really significantly uh, uh, improve. Uh, thank you very, very much. I mean, that, uh, that allowed deep insight. And do you think uh, uh, you mentioned uh, China was perhaps even surprised by uh, what, what they've been doing and obviously uh, perhaps also the European side. Uh, how, how, how can we, how did we move into such a, a doldrum and how to get out? Uh, and you mentioned one, one person, one personality, Angela Merkel. Uh, would it make sense, for instance, to, to have her or a person like her, those not really being long in office anymore, but having high, you know, uh, all these acknowledgements, uh, and also one from the China side, just you know, to to create a different bridge, which is not really formally existing now. Well, I, I know her a bit personally, and I must say she's calm, cool, collected. And unfortunately, she's leaving the German top government, um, and uh, we have a new government, which is driven by polls, by public opinion. Mm -hmm. And if you look into the uh, German yellow press, in particular the Bild Zeitung. Uh, you can sense already that uh, they have targeted China and that really shapes the opinion of millions. So I honestly, I think for her, it will be over. Uh, she has mm -hmm. high credentials here, but she's ex officio. She doesn't have the, the leverage anymore. Um, and the new government, as well as the new uh, or the French elections uh, will narrow the field uh, further. So uh, I guess uh, first and foremost, uh, if it doesn't get worse in Europe, then already it's good. But China really has to think about how their language, how their actions are coming across. I mean, this incredible, sophisticated diplomats turned into wolf warriors, which, you know, <laughs> I still can't understand. Um, and uh, the way that uh, the Huawei uh, marketing went on, the lobbying, the kind of threats uh, being company to face the kind of hostage taking, frankly, that took place over here, makes it very, very difficult. At the same time, uh, we acknowledge the size of the market, the importance of the market. We want to be part of that. China needs Europe, European business. 40% uh, of technologies uh, come from Europe. China needs Europe on the climate change discussion. Uh, carbon mm -hmm. neutrality means that China has to shut down 660 gigawatt of coal-fired power station. After all, China burns half of the global coal. Uh, and 660 gigawatt, by the way, is the entire European Union uh, power fleet. So what China's mm -hmm. pledging is turn down, shut down one time Europe and uh, put it up again as renewable, where they need European know-how, uh, not only in wind and solar and whatnot, but also in systems and insulation and so on and so on. We need each other and it would be fatal in the time when we are fighting against climate change and COVID to actually let these kind of language that uh, may possibly both sides display uh, derail this. But honestly, uh, uh, it is very, very depressing for someone like myself who has been here 30 years. I came here the first time 40 years ago. I've seen all the changes. Uh, to all of a sudden realize that on the political side, uh, it becomes much more uh, stiff and rigid uh, uh, to an extent which I frankly have hardly experienced, not even in the early 80s. Now, I, I need to apologize uh, um, at uh, Kurt Fasser. He has sent me a note. Kurt Fasser is a long time long-standing lecturer at the MCI and he was a, a successful businessman for decades in, in, in China. And uh, I think I have a ra I've been raising his question questions, uh, not de deliberately, I just uh, saw it coming in and see a number of questions coming in now, but I think it's your turn, Boy, uh, to, uh, to bring your input. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. Uh, uh, Mr. Wutke, uh, thank you very much uh, in this way. So you underlined importance of China. Um, so this is also, I think, the reason why uh, we are now, I am here in Innsbruck, and um, to give students some information in this kind of about China. Like you said, China is a very important part 
uh, in the last years, I think also in the future, like you give us a lot of facts, the data is so impressive. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But my question now in this way is, do you think uh, from the European science, do they really uh, uh, so aware about the importance of China. And the second, you you describe pretty a lot about China. You, Mr. Wutka, I know you have a, a very long experience in China. If I uh, am not wrong, almost 40 years. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it's a good reason we can talk about old friends. I still know that time 40 years ago, like Mr. Zhu Rongji, the former Premier Minister, right? He's so a uh, guy uh, in China. Probably today nobody knows. But the, my my point is uh, what do you think about uh, China is not the China 20 years ago. China has changed so much. Yeah, This is what I uh, uh, experienced from the science of European science and you experience that in China. Yeah, You are much closer to there. Do you think uh, the, do you think it is for the European science, a European company and the people, they really recognize this change of China. That could probably uh, 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 clarify some reasons how China, now the reaction, or you can say the overreaction this time, yeah, uh, uh, surprised a lot of people in Europe. Yeah, well, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. First of all, uh, Mr. Fasser was a icon in the German business community in Shanghai, so I'm very happy uh, that he's uh, listening in. Uh, he was a very long time in the German chamber. I was actually chairman of the European uh, German chamber in 2001 to 2004 when he's uh, when he was uh, based in in Shanghai. Well, you know, do Europeans understand China? Well, both ends definitely have a, uh, a lot of homework to do in order to understand each other better. But, you know, the observation from here in Beijing is that uh, I have never witnessed this kind of uh, aggressive uh, bullying uh, that, that comes from uh, government agencies. So it is not just, uh, you know, criticism from far away from media and whatnot. Um, it is actually experienced here to the point where uh, we are losing a, a lot of uh, experts. Uh, we can't uh, get them anymore. Uh, in, in Germany, at least, I know that uh, only half the students uh, love to study Chinese that used to be. So there's, China lost its allure, frankly speaking, and uh, I guess that uh, uh, China has to contemplate about how that could happen so fast. Um, it's tragic because we need more students, we need more engagement, more people engaging with China, and we are diminishing here. Uh, there are more foreigners in Luxembourg than there are in Beijing and Shanghai put together. Just imagine. So it's very hard uh, to get to, to get to common ground, uh, basically, when uh, the cultural exchange has been stifled. Uh, uh, for example, Chinese professors uh, cannot uh, uh, come to the embassy or chambers. Uh, likewise, uh, we have um, the inability of our diplomats to speak at Chinese universities. So it's in small cuts where basically the communication has been uh, impaired. And then, of course, it does make it easier to do everything online between our leaders. And uh, so it's small steps, uh, both sides possibly to be blamed. But uh, I, I don't see an exit ramp there. The understanding of China in the business community is, is huge, is vast. We know, I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Uh, but also we know very much uh, how much we are losing out due to the inaccessibility uh, in some areas in the marketplace. If you look up the European Chamber website, you go to um, publications, you find our flagship uh, publication, uh, pa the position paper, it comes out in September. And there our working groups, 1,700 members across nine cities in China put together where we see room to improve uh, recommendations, 900 as a matter of fact, on 400 pages. So uh, there's a lot to be done here uh, because the market access is totally asymmetrical. And of course that went okay for quite a period of time, but now uh, European decision makers get more and more impatient. So there we are. China's importance in business is increasing. China's uh, allure globally is decreasing. And uh, uh, it, is, it is something where uh, I see that actually the leadership here doesn't care too much, frankly. Um, I have these meetings with ministers and top leaders and they say, you know, 
uh, what the hell, uh, you're down, we're up, and, and this is going to go on like this. It's not nice, frankly. Um, and uh, again, I, I, I really worry about uh, the Europeans tightening the screws uh, with more actions uh, aligning, you might call it ganging up with the United States, uh, and that then causes a China counter reaction. So there's a lot of potential of going downstairs, so to speak. So I'm, I'm really hoping that people on both sides are starting to contemplate and find very small steps in order to rebuild trust in order to actually make that uh, relationship happen. And the problem is not just uh, Europe's, you know, if you look into again, the, um, uh, you know, favorable and unfavorable rating of uh, China in Korea, and Korea has uh, shared a common history uh, with uh, China. It's 82% negative. In Japan, it's 85% negative. So in a matter of fact, you have a more critical view on China in the neighborhood, and that clearly doesn't come from lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. Just right. may, may sure, I add sure. one? Yeah, sure. It's okay, good. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Wutke, uh, you are right in this way. Uh, you are long enough in China, right? We still remember Mr. Deng Xiaoping. This was, was the guy, uh, he made a Chinese policy. He told us, Kao Guang Yang Hui, that means to, uh, to keep your profile low and just work on it. That was the reform in China. And now Mr. Xi Jinping on the, uh, on the, on the power, and he just turned it around. He said it's very clearly, politically, very clearly to say China is now on the time to, to come on the stage. I think this is very clear from the top down side. Uh, on the other side, it's very clear. I think the people in China and that awareness, how they deal with, how they look up uh, to the Western country is changing as well, like you mentioned uh, so far. So I just want to put it, I think it is right. China yeah. is now okay. really going on to another stage. Yes, let me, let me say that unfortunately, really my video is not working, so you can't see the picture behind where I'm sitting. Uh, it displays my hero, uh, who is Deng Xiaoping, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, Zhong Ji is another one of those uh, uh, people I was blessed to meet many times, uh, even in his retirement, just as recent as two years ago. And it's a completely different breed of people, totally different, totally different policies, way of thinking, way of engaging, being critical, uh, accepting criticism, which is totally different by now. And that's the thing I worry about because I come from a country which has seen an incredible success story for 30 years of uninterrupted strong economic growth, uh, entering the stage uh, in global politics, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, urbanization, industrialization, success, success left and right. Uh, talk about Germany in the, in the imperial days, of course. And then, of course, there was the question, what the hell are we going to do with the Brits, you know? And then there was this uh, antagonism which built up because Germany felt like uh, the Brits are blocking the way to the sun. And it's sometimes eerily, if you compare that with China and the United States, now, as, as Mark Twain says, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. So it doesn't have to necessarily go down this road, but I mean, we all know how dangerous sleepwalking is and how dangerous it is in order to come as a new kid on the block. China is no new kid, it's a comeback story uh, and, and has to fit in there. So uh, at this stage, uh, I hope that still reason will prevail and. Uh, people will become a little bit more sober and not carried away by nationalism. Uh, you've been mentioning e elections or pre-election periods uh, like Germany. They always uh, bring in extra complexities with respect to, you know, uh, to uh, solutions, uh, pragmatic solutions. But I would uh, like to bring in uh, questions from the audience and uh, they are coming in. They are really a number of them. Now, Robert Hupfauf from Liechtenstein has sent me a question. Uh, do you see an influence of the United States, for instance, and or of the COVID crisis uh, contrib contributing to the communications uh, where we stand now, or right? lack of communications? Yes, obviously. I mean, first of all, uh, Trump was uh, uh, destructive. Uh, he was uh, absolutely the facilitator of a breakup in the relationship of China, Europe, uh, and uh, you know, China and, and the US, as well as Europe and the US. Uh, and uh, we, we can really 
uh, say that 2017 was was the game changing year. You know, the U.S. went hostile um, and took on China, and uh, China uh, reciprocated. So um, now it's it's a uh, same um, uh, situation on the on the on the hill. Uh, you have you have Democrats and Republicans disagreeing virtually of everything except one topic, which is unfortunately China. There's only one topic which actually across the aisle finds support. And so for Joe Biden, of course, he's not going to waste political capital on actually doing something against the main flow of politics on the Hill. So you can imagine that this tense relationship uh, will continue. Uh, Europe basically, uh, of course, uh, we wanted to be on our own. Uh, we made this very clear, but again, you know, uh, with the investment agreement and the sanctions that has basically driven, unfortunately, I guess, uh, Europe in the arms of the Americans. I hope that we can still have our own policy, or as uh, High Representative Borrell said, uh, you know, uh, we, Europe has to do the Sinatra doctrine. We do it our way, my way. Um, so, in a way, um, that that situation is pretty much predictable, honestly. Um, the US and Europe uh, will now try to find common ground. And uh, they do it with the uh, G7 partners. Uh, don't forget India. India has been extremely stressed by China. Um, and China has made a point of antagonizing most of Southeast Asia. So in a way, it, it looks like it's all pre-cooked and, and China will be uh, uh, surrounded by uh, contrarian uh, systems and countries, uh, with the notable exception of the country of my wife, uh, which is Russia. Uh, which is a staunch friend, in particular at the leadership level. Um, and I know the insights there. My father-in-law has been 14 years Russian ambassador to China. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I guess that's possibly the only good relationship that China has at this stage. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Putin, they are pretty good friends, all right? Very good friends. Genuinely, mm -hmm. genuinely good friends, yes. Uh, that's an interesting topic, but I, I would like to come to a different one. Uh, and uh, the, the inter interesting uh, to me is how deep the relationship really is, or whether it's more a functional one. But you know, I'm not sure whether you want to com comment on this. Elsewise, I would uh, I would uh, bring in questions from Mr. Mahinda Kari. He's the chairman of the Indo Global Academia Alliance, a dear friend of uh, of the MCI. And he lives in New Delhi and in London, and he has been the long chairman of uh, CARI uh, Associates. Uh, and uh, now I bring in perhaps uh, a combination of his questions. Now, he says, uh, thank you, Mr. Wodke, lots of uh, interesting ide uh, data indeed. But speaking of quality, how does the German workmanship compare with that of the Chinese? Uh, especially, for instance, if you compare certain products, uh, products or uh, also uh, chocolates, compare those of Switzerland. Um, well, um, of course, I mean, the, the, the straightforward answer would be nobody can beat, beat Swiss workmanship, you know. <laughs> Um, uh, maybe the Austrians can, but uh, uh, of course, it, it depends on the area you look at. Uh, we are still, we Europeans are still, I think, on top of the hill when it comes to cars, cars manufacturing. China's catching up in a different uh, lane uh, with new energy vehicles. Uh, that's something to watch uh, again. You know, if you are uh, driving around Beijing uh, virtually, you'll find uh, 20 to 30 new. Uh, brands, uh, Chinese brands on, on new energy vehicles, they all look very, very smart, extremely good design. Um, mm -hmm. But again, uh, we don't know how long they're going to last as this is the first generation of battery driven Chinese uh, cars. Uh, but, you know, we also have uh, proven champions like Chile that has uh, bought a stake into Mercedes Benz uh, and at, at the same time has saved Volvo and turned the company around. So these are skillful managers over here. It's not just textiles and electronics and so forth. But um, uh, it, there's also an interesting thing about um, uh, the, the comparison global and Chinese production quality. Um, recently, Tsai Xin had a great article. Tsai Xin is the best Chinese uh, uh, weekly, I think weekly uh, magazine. 
uh, and uh, Zhang Weiming, uh, Zhang Weiming, a, a very good journalist, said, you know, China can produce everything the world has to offer to China, just faster and better and cheaper. But the world has more to offer to China, which we Chinese cannot produce. Now, how how is that? Uh, it all boils down to innovation and and research and development, and that's where China's Achilles uh, heel is. That's where they really the weakness are. So whatever they can produce, it's pretty good quality. And of course, the export data speak for themselves. But at the same time, they're still incredibly vulnerable at future technologies. For example, on semiconductors, there is no way any time, I mean decades, where China's going to catch up with Taiwan, for example. On the, on the uh, electronics side, on the uh, semiconductor production side, machinery, software, um, the monopoly of five countries is staggering. It's between 98 and 100 uh, percent and is ruled by Holland, um, uh, Taiwan, Korea, Japan and the United States. China is highly vulnerable uh, for, towards this kind of future technologies. China is very good and has super quality and new technologies beating what the Europeans have to offer, uh, basically um, in, in business solutions and in applications. China is really not good at uh, destructive uh, creativity, as we call it in my company. The real breakthrough, the new technologies, the Steve Jobs and so forth. They always use and have to use foreign technologies in order to bring up systems and products which frankly are better than Europeans. I mean, the iPhone is produced over here. But again, the, fi the flight, uh, the Comac uh, plane, for example, which got off the ground after, I don't know, $300 billion uh, put on this one, and 90% uh, is foreign equipment. Um, so it just shows you how far away the country still is from top end technologies and how vulnerable it is. I guess they must be sleepless nights. But final point, so quality of workmanship. I can assure you in my chemical world, we, when we are putting up factories in China, we're better than our colleagues in Europe. Is it all right if I bring in other questions from, from the audience, or do you have Please. questions? Um, uh, in, in, in this way, probably just bring some, um, some, some um, upstate news. I, I, I don't know if the, for the audience also interesting. Uh, talk about the quality, talk about uh, the new technology. Huawei published, uh, I think, three or four days ago. I don't know if for everybody is uh, is already know and uh, the new uh, operating system. Yeah, uh, I think this is pretty interesting. In China, this is uh, as I know a campaign, like Mr. Woodtucker uh, told us about the semi products. You are right because this is some uh, competition from the size of the United States, and China is really really under pressure, and like Huawei did. But China now opened some campaign to say that we want our own products. As is always the same story, China uh, uh, developed some new things. And the Huawei is now, I think, just published the third, the worldwide third operating system named, I think, Harmony OS, like iOS and uh, the third one besides iOS and, and, and Android. I think this is, could be the way uh, the, the China uh, the working on their own solutions. Yeah, uh, I don't know, Mr. Wojtko, what's your uh, uh, opinion? I think this is China is really working on their, uh, like you said, this is some weakness in Chinese product. The China is now, I think they 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 pretty aware of that and working on that. That is my uh, observation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Uh... Huawei is a fantastic company at incredible knowledge, engineering, and so forth. Uh, it is a disaster to see how the Americans have sliced and diced Huawei and basically forced them uh, on their way out of the mobile phone market. I'm not so sure, really. I, I don't know how that system is working. I think experts are still testing it. Uh, it is damn difficult uh, to compete against the Google driven Android and, and other systems. 
uh, remains to be seen. The beneficiary, by the way, of the downfall of Huawei mobile phones were Chinese mobile phone companies like Oppo and Xiaomi, excellent products themselves. So uh, I think, honestly, uh, I guess that China, no, Huawei will not too long focus on mobile phones. They will move into more uh, upscale uh, cloud and so forth. Uh, remains to be seen. It's a versatile company. It has uh, great management. And we have to see how that works out. But at the same time, I think there is a, a clear uh, awareness in the leadership is um, you cannot uh, basically shorten uh, cycles in business by throwing money at the problem. Uh, the mm -hmm. Africans have a proverb for this. It says, uh, if you pull a grass, it doesn't grow faster. And uh, so in many ways, uh, I think it would be delusional to believe that if China has identified the shortcomings and problems, and there are many, uh, that they will basically be able to close the gap. It would be much better, much better, if China would say, okay, uh, let's compromise, let's find common ground, and we keep buying that from Holland or from Taiwan and other places. Let's be less confrontational. Why do we have to waste billions to get where others have been 10 years ago? Why not actually just keep doing what we did greatly over the last 40 years? Globalization, supply chains uninterrupted, not uh, driven by nationalism or politics. So I guess actually it would be much better if this uh, kind of t attempt of catching up uh, would, not be, uh, would not be pursued because it might create a lot of waste and that's the problem. Um, uh, China has uh, spent, I don't know how many billions of dollars on semiconductor companies and they go bust one by one now, clearly indicating that companies took advantage of the good nature of the government trying to basically get them up and running. I was just in Wuhan, where it's one of those cases. Uh, so China's running the risk of uh, wasting a lot of money in order to be where others have been before. Um, I guess that's not the proper way. China has incredible innovative skills. Uh, again, the private enterprises are staggering. If the results of our survey, which we will launch tomorrow, indicates an unbelievable 70%, 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent, 70 of our members believe that China's products and is as competitive or even better than European products, 70%. That mm -hmm. gives you two ideas. First of all, they really are catching up and you have to compete here in order to stay in the game. And then secondly, it just proves the point that China doesn't need all these market entry restrictions because their companies already are damn good now. Uh, I have been receiving a number of questions again, and um, be, uh, perhaps, uh, I, I mean, I would have uh, mine as well, but uh, let's be polite to our audience and also um, uh, let them uh, raise their topic. Now, Jacqueline Möhre, she is in Neubrandenburg, and I think she is uh, linked to the SMT, our academic partner of today. And she has sending me the following note or question. Now, the negative public opinion about China emerged with the 2008 Olympics, where German media were driving a strong anti-China campaign. By that time, politics let it, let it go and followed this narrative instead of putting the picture straight. So, this could have been prevented also without any strategy by the European Union, how to deal with China, where do we go? Don't you think it is too late to establish a prosperous EU German or, and or EU, uh, uh, EU German relationship with China? Well, let me first address the first part of your question, the media part, uh, you know, uh, I know from Angela Merkel, she gets this very often. They say, oh, the German media is so critical on China and so forth. Uh, and she says, you know, uh, she, she said to Li Keqiang, I advise you to have your embassy in Berlin translating articles how the German media writes about me, Angela Merkel. It's just the way media is reporting. I mean, if you just look at German or British media covering Trump and the United States, you might consider that we are in a war, which of course we're not. So in a way, I think China is too thin skinned and should not focus on these so-called negative reports. Everyone has to deal with negative reports and just carry on. And on, this, on the flip side of that, um, if you live as long as I do here, if you look at Global Times, particularly the Chinese version, you will see that there's a three-step approach. One is 
first page, first uh, uh, 10 minutes in CCTV is like, you know, uh, the leadership. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Second part <laughs> is, um, uh, it's always uh, negative on Europe, is negative on the US, uh, races, uh, COVID, uh, this and this and that. The Chinese media is not sparing the Europeans of criticism, not at all. And then the third part always is in newspapers as well as CCTV, like, and we do it better in China. I mean, you know, if you have this uh, stable of media coverage, then of course, uh, you actually get a very distorted view from here on to Europe and the United States. Partly mm -hmm. rightfully critical because Europe has and the US have dismantled the global financial system in 2008, 2009. Uh, Brexit and Donald Trump, the elections were not definitely the charming highlight of democracy. But at the same time, you know, China has its own problems, which of course it covers up and doesn't want to be discussed. So in a way, it's a very lopsided affair. I guess really China has to do its own homework in order to get its uh, pictures right and not be as confrontational uh, as it is. And of course, we should encourage uh, Europeans to study more Chinese, to travel to, Europe, to China, uh, to take up jobs related to China in order to experience the can-do uh, attitude, the kind of vibrant society you find over here, the kind of, you know, China spirit that is, is really intoxicating for, for business. Um, so it's not all politics here. I mean, uh, uh, really, I must say, distinguish that. Um, I disagree with a lot of stuff from the system. I admire the Chinese as people and as business people. Um, and, and again, but if you know, at this stage, it's very difficult. We can't get our people in. People don't want to study. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a slippery slope in the wrong direction, I'm afraid. I have uh, two questions. One is uh, from myself and another one from Mr. Mahindakari. And then uh, perhaps uh, way sorry, I saw you sign that too late. Uh, the you are question, faster. <laughs> uh, the, the one question is, uh, that's mine. Now, every party or each party is actually expecting from the other say, side the first move, perhaps, or, 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 or to move in general. Now, would you think it is by nature uh, easier for the Chinese side to move as uh, Europeans have, you know, a stronger sense of dem uh, democracy and everything a politician does will immediately uh, be uh, thrown uh, into, into or will, will be criticized by me, the media and, uh, and uh, the uh, oppositional parties. Just by definition, it will be easier for the Chinese side, not talking about arguments or the, you know, the, the not, not assessing the arguments per se. I mean, Francis Fukuyama was covering that in his most recent book, Identity, where he said the, the West, uh, the downfall of the West uh, is caused by vetocracy, veto. Uh, everybody can veto. That leads mm -hmm. to a talking shop and endless discussions and another discussion and it shows up in, in areas where actually uh, the former star performer Germany can't even build a decent airport. So it, it, is, it is something where I think uh, we have lost our way. We should see how we can make decision making better and faster. Uh, the, indeed, uh, it, it looks more difficult, but at the same time, the, the cacophony of this kind of complexity in European decision making has also its virtue. You all stand behind it. Uh, in China, it's totally different. The president is almighty, all powerful. He makes the decisions. His uh, entourage is then putting the rubber on the road and tries to translate that. There is no more policy discussion here, unlike uh, it was uh, during the Zhong Jia Deng Xiaoping times when there was a very vivid policy discussion. So in a way, it looks from the outside very easy. At the same time, the president is also pretty much constrained. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, he has to uh, look into a lot of constituencies and interest groups uh, that uh, might actually not be uh, favorable for him. But, uh, you know, he's in his primaries as well. The, uh, Xi Jinping is running for a third term in October, November next year. Um, and he has to accommodate a lot of people because uh, it's the first time since a long while that uh, he's going to bust this kind of Deng Xiaoping imposed uh, a cap on, on uh, 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 durations in office. Uh, that is, uh, so it's not done yet. Um, and that limits, of course, the president in its political space in order to make 
favorable decisions for the West or looking more engaging and so forth. Uh, uh, I, to me, frankly, uh, meeting those officials uh, off the record also, uh, it looks like they are sitting on the back of a tiger called nationalism where they are slightly shocked themselves on how volatile this is. I give you an example. Um, when they decided to go after H&M, the Swedish uh, clothes retailer, um, uh, the uh, social media in China, that's a real anger accelerator. The social media in China went ballistic. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden you saw Nike shoes, Adidas shoes burning. Uh, and the leadership was shocked because Adidas and Nike are supporters of the Olympics. And the last thing they wanted is that sponsors of the Olympics are being chased down the road uh, by the nationalistic forces of the internet. So in a way, it's, it's uh, I guess, the room to maneuver here is very, very difficult uh, for the Communist Party. Uh, they have to display uh, success. Uh, they, they have to uh, basically come across as, as very successful on the COVID handling, which they are. Um, but at the same time, it leaves the nagging feeling of uh, what happened in December 2019, you know. And uh, so it's, it's not as straightforward that autocratic systems uh, have a faster decision-making process, um, uh, possibly, but uh, it might not be the best decision moment. Uh, in, in democracies, at least you have a consensus-seeking style, uh, and it painful as the process might look like, as Tip O'Meal always says, democracy is like making a sausage. You don't want to know what goes in there. Very nice statement and, and also very insightful. I think uh, many European decision makers do perhaps not see uh, the difficulties or complexities also on, uh, in the, uh, on the side of the Chinese uh, leaders. Uh, now, perhaps uh, the question of uh, Mr. Mahinda Kari, and then uh, we, I think it's your turn. Um, now, uh, and he has been send, sending me a question regarding environmental issues. Uh, if we look back uh, in earlier decades, uh, he writes, uh, the, the Chinese uh, environmental policy perhaps was not as friendly to the environment. Uh, but how would you see this now? And uh, now my question is, uh, is uh, in addition to his, now wouldn't this be a topic to find common grounds and, 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 and take this as a very nice example where we can both win? Clearly, I was trying to refer to this at the beginning that we have a common interest uh, to get away from coal. Uh, again, China, half of the coal globally is uh, being uh, fired up here. Um, and yes, it has to be. We, we share the same air. There is no difference in climate change. It doesn't sort of get hotter here and gets cooler elsewhere. So it's obvious that this and also biodiversity are the topics where clearly uh, we have uh, a lot in common. And I must say, uh, you know, I remember very well the denial in which the government left. You know, it's, oh, no, it's not big pollution. It's a blue sky day. It was pitch dark. Um, you could barely see the next house and uh, how they lamented about the fact that the U.S. put up a device on the embassy that measured the quality of the air, um, how they were attacking it like, uh, you know, Geneva Convention violated and so forth. And from that kind of denial and attack, it has dramatically 180 degrees changed in very, very short time. And it's, I guess, frankly, it has to do with Xi Jinping. It's uh, the man has uh, uh, realized the middle class. The urban middle class doesn't really like uh, to to have a shorter lifespan uh, given the air quality. Um, and uh, the the sky turned blue. I can see I can see clouds now, which I saw in the 80s and then vanished. Um, and uh, that has been incredible success. And it doesn't stop there. Water is one of his concerns, and it's actually really a challenge to put up a chemical site along the Yangtze River because of the issues on, on water. Um, though this, this has been the most dramatic, I would say, a change in policy that has been the most successful. So when the president says uh, uh, climate neutral by 2060, um, uh, it, uh, it looks impossible. But I think he really means it. The problem is his government apparently didn't get the memo last year uh, when he did this pledge in September. And uh, they came up with a 14 5 year plan, which is really falling short on the environmental side tremendously. <clears throat> it doesn't give you any indication of how that will be achieved 
Um, so I guess uh, that uh, that the government now is being educated about, you know, you should better listen to what your president is saying. And you can see the impact already in Guangdong, uh, where they are shutting down plants, they are trying to limit coal burning and so forth, and it leaves major destruction in uh, industrial uh, production lines. Uh, so uh, I think it is, it is just stop and go. But uh, yes, it has been, I would say, the biggest success story of this administration. Thank you very much, Wei. It's your turn. Yeah, thank you very much. I just tried to put it very short because of the time, but I think it's a very, very important uh, part. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wutke. You put it, made it very clear how different the two parts are, yeah, from the political system, from the economic system, how China works, it's just different compared to Europe, right? So what I would like to uh, point it out, you mentioned before, what about, about the soft power? How can we work together? We have to work together, yeah? Uh, but it is so difficult, why? I think the point made very short is the communication. Communication uh, is the key, uh, the, uh, it's also in the theory said if the communication doesn't work, the business fails, right? So it is so difficult. I have also experience in the company uh, how to communicate with each other. I just want to make one point. I think the differences in this way is that the, 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 the value, the preference of value are so different. Like in the European side, I think more or less the democracy is, is a very important value. I hope you will agree with me. So I also have been here for a very long time and individualism, right? And also a little bit the regional thinking. And this is in China totally different, I think. I, I got one study as this is raised end of last year. The people said, what is the most important thing for Chinese? What would you say? Yeah, not the freedom of speech. It was endeavor. Strange, yeah? No European people say, what is so important for me? And the second place is solidarity and the unity. So I think behind that, you can understand a little bit why the Chinese people, they think differently, they act differently. And the form, form is for them so important. They said, just make failure, it's no problem, but we, I, we, I have to stick on my success. I think just to make a little bit picture, uh, the cultural background, was, we don't have time to, uh, to, to explain, but this is exactly what we do in the China Center. We teach the students, we let them know, let the society know, be aware of the culture, about the history, yeah? But to make it just, just to how important to understand both sides, to make the good communication, and then I think it will be a chance for us to work together, probably to have success together. Just yes. want to add well, on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me just state that uh, uh, I think both uh, parties have to respect the system of the other party. That's a given. Uh, we, are not, we are not here in order to make system change. China should not change democracy and should stop meddling around. We should do the same here, respect this. Uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, elaborate a bit on, on the label of Chinese. You know, I was here in 89 in spring and uh, the city was brimming with uh, slogans of democracy and freedom. So it's not an alien concept. Uh, uh, even enlightenment uh, was, was mentioned there. Of course, it was cracked down and gone. But just about a year, uh, just about uh, a couple of days ago, we had the anniversary. And I remember very vividly being here that as a matter of fact, this concept of individualism was not alien. Yes, in the broad sense, uh, definitely China is more uh, group thinking, solidarity is highly rated and so forth, totally agree. But also let me say I lived in Taiwan for one year in 84, 85, long time ago. Um, and I would say the Taiwanese are Chinese in essence, uh, just minus uh, uh, the experience of communism since 1949. And I must say that also there, uh, it's a different behavior. So I would not say that the Chinese are like this and the Westerners are like that. I think there is more of uh, 50 grades of shade, uh, 50 grades of grayness and areas where I would say China is displaying far more diversity than it maybe looks from far away. Mm -hmm. Eric, I need to apologize. We have already been exploiting your time uh, perhaps one final, really last final question, if you allow. Uh, is, there, is there recommendations uh, which you would uh, give uh, 
uh, which you would make to universities like the MCI? What could you, should we do to contribute? I mean, first of all, uh, have discussion rounds like this. Uh, we, might, we might depart uh, not necessarily agreeing, but I think we all might leave more smarter. Um, I guess that uh, uh, there has to be, um, uh, there has to be indeed uh, the skills, as the Chinese put it, two ears, one mouth, maybe listening better and talking less, uh, which I've done definitely violated the last hour. But um, uh, it is something where um, we, we possibly need um, universities uh, stressing um, the kind of um, um, overreaching uh, ability to connect with the Chinese. Again, politics is just, I think their politics very difficult. I, I, I'm really very negative on this one. So I guess if, if, if universities find areas where China is sparkling, such as private owned enterprises, innovation, um, the kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, leapfrogging in environmental areas, uh, the kind of uh, cultural issues, uh, that that is prevalent here. I think uh, possibly in universities we have to cover or you have to cover politics in order to ex explain what the president said and explain what our guys are doing. But to me, um, uh, I look for the soft factors to find common ground um, and that is positively associated and frankly, uh, after so many years, I must say uh, I'm, I'm blessed to be in a country which I still find totally enticing, controversial, but uh, it is it is enriching in many, many ways. So I think uh, focusing on the positive sides of the topics, uh, stay stay away from politics. Uh, you have to cover it, uh, see how you may manage that. Uh, but um, China has more to offer. Dear Wei Manske Wang and dear Mr. Jörg Wurtke, thank you so much on behalf of our university, of the ASMD, of our media partners, of our event partners, of our students, alumni and friends for your great contributions. I have learned a lot. I, I, do, I do my best to read what, uh, as much as I can, but uh, I have been really learning a lot and I think the audience has done the same. Please apologize, our technical issues are not having, uh, you know, been able to somehow bring you um, live on screen, but I think it did not harm our discussion. Thank you, the two of you. And let me brief, uh, briefly give an overview on uh, this uh, week, uh, on the next days to come. Already tomorrow, uh, we will be happy to welcome Mr. Friedrich von Bohlen und Halbach. He's managing partner and uh, co-founder of the Divini Hop Biotech Holding uh, GmbH. He's uh, one of the founders and, and he's the chief executive of Molecular, Molecular, Molecular Health GmbH and Heidelberg, and he will talk about the biotech and digital health uh, challenges. Uh, on Wednesday, we will be hosting William Bissell. He is the chairman of Fab India in New Delhi, and he's an, a multi-entrepreneur in India. And uh, also on uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, we will be happy to welcome the former president of the European Commission, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, Excellency Jean-Claude Juncker, dear friend of our uh, little university. Hope you have uh, the opportunity to join us and also the week will provide more events. Thank you so much to you, all of you, to our team, to our technicians, to our media studio. Thank you so much. I hope you have a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you're welcome. You know, the invitation is still on air, it's still valid. Yeah, sorry, but I think you didn't miss much by not seeing me. So thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye.